Hello, it's it's me again, and this is Caves of Cord again. I realise Hex made a video about this game already, uh, but he kind of he kind of made a new character and ran out into the world, into the wilderness, to show you what's awesome about this game. And it's like that's hard to do. The awesome stuff comes later. So I've got I've got an older character, and hopefully I'll be able to tell you what's great about this game. I think this game deserves a bit more of your time, and if you're willing to give that time, thank you very much. I'll I'll try and you know tell you why this game is great so this is i guess an addendum to roguelike week this is a, a little bonus roguelike uh bank holiday monday on uh this saturday right so this is this is my character right now this is caves of hood i'm in a cave i'm in a, a, a let's get rid of that notification i mean a just a the subterranean of the desert canyon so not a special cave and, and i guess the first thing i want to say about this game is this this cave that i'm in which is just the underground part of a normal part of the map. This isn't a named cave. This isn't a boss's lair. This isn't like an ancient facility that I've gone into. This is just a normal cave that's everywhere. This kind of goes under the whole of the map pretty much-ish. You know, there are caves like this under the whole of the map is what I want to say. Um, and if you took this this particular cave, if you took this out, uh, extracted it, and released just this cave as a standalone game, this would be your average half-assed roguelike on on Steam. This would be Dungeons of Dreadmore. Um, this game's yeah, it's it's great. It's it's a whole level above those things. Anyway, I'm just going to quickly show you my character, and then I'm going to pop back to character creation, and then come back to this bit. Uh, I think I just punched the microphone. I apologise for that. Right. So my so my character is uh, level fifteen. There, I'm about halfway towards a bit over halfway towards level sixteen. Uh, and I've gone high agility. Uh, this, I guess this is a little tip for people who are starting this game. If you're, if you're trying to play it a particular way and you're just dying a lot and you just want to like learn the game, learn the mechanics before you, before you play the way you want to play, just build a high agility character. High agility gives you high DV, which I think is like dodge value. Um, and that means that enemies have to do a really high hit roll to hit you. So most melee attacks will miss you if you if you just start the game with really high agility. And that's just a way of like getting a bit deeper into the game, learning its mechanics and its systems and all the stuff. That's a little tip. So I am this high agility high agility character. I've got I've got some dual wielding going on. These are these are my skills and abilities and that. Uh, some are passive, some are active. So this is the stuff I've invested into. Uh, I'm obviously it's just a quick overview. Right. So that's my character right now. We'll come back to that in a second. I'm just going to save and quit. Uh, go to new game. So first, the first thing I want to say about this game is you can play as, and Hex he covered a lot of this, you can play as a mutated human, wherein you get mutations and moderate starting attributes, or you can play as a true kin, which is essentially a human, a humanoid. Uh, you get higher starting attributes. You get access to cybernetics, which is pretty cool. Uh, you get more skill points. You get blah. You get rebuke robots, which is a little um, ability where you can charm a robot. Essentially, you can if if you if your ego is high enough, you'll bring the, it'll become an ally. Otherwise, it will just stop attacking you. So that's a handy little skill when you when you wander into uh, a high tech place. Uh, I'll go. I'll go for okay. The, the mutated human. Uh, oh, it does specifically say human. So I guess the true kin are humans. So a mutated human. You when you level up. Instead of putting points into into skills, you get mutations. So you can make a character with six arms if you want to, or two heads, or I think many legs or horns. So if you've got horns and the charge skill, then you'd be really good at the charge skill. You'd be good at like ramming into people. If you've got many arms, uh, you can have a weapon in each of those arms and a worn thing on each of those arms. So you can imagine like you know six armed sword wielding thing coming at you that's pretty fucking scary but it's, it's generally considered that the mutated way of playing is is the harder way of playing if you're playing for the first time go with true kin and just work the game out a bit first i've I, I think i've played once as a mutated human and it was really early on i didn't understand what the fuck was going on uh so i went over to true kin and i've played been playing true kin since then I, I'm trying to get deep enough into the game that I feel like, like okay, now I'm confident enough to play as a mutated human, and I've not hit that point yet. Um, other people will just keep playing mutated human and get really good at it. So you know, whatever, whatever you, whatever you want to do, do it. But 
you know, if you're just starting out, play play True Kid a few times before you venture into Mutated Human, I would say. All right, let's uh, have a look at the True Kid. So let's just put some random points in. I just want to show you the choices that come after this. There we go. Right. So you choose your Arcology and Cast. So these three things are the Arcology, the Toxic Arboreta of the Ukimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimim
uh, that can just wipe you out. So, but this game lets you look at enemies and it gives you here, so this says average. Uh, if that was trivial or easy, it would say trivial or easy, meaning I can beat it easily. Average means that, that thing is about as strong as me. And then it goes tough, very tough, other things impossible. Uh, so this thing is average. So this this is an Arcanaut. This is a, these are people who just delve into the caves and collect technology and sell it, presumably. Uh, and it gives, gives a description of her there. But yeah, the average is is what you want to pay attention to. That would be you know on paper a fair fight. This doesn't take certain things into account. Like this, this person could be carrying like a hundred grenades, which wouldn't be taken into account in that. But it's a it's a good indication of shit you don't want to tangle with right now. Or at least shit you want to be very, very careful with. Uh, right, so we're, we're in this anonymous cave. Actually, I've just noticed I'm hungry, so let's uh, make camp with G. Use a direction. Use that campfire so I can whip up a meal here. If I, if I had the cooking skill, I could choose the ingredients to cook with and I could get buffs and stuff, but I'm just going to whip up a meal. There we go. Eating the meal, no longer hungry. I'm thirsty, though. Know. There we go. Here's a little drink. Right, so uh, I just want to—I was just going to give you an overview of where I'm up to. So as I say, I'm fairly confident in where I am now. Uh, so that's my character. That's my stats. I've got very high agility, fairly high strength, and my toughness is starting to get decent. As Hex rightly pointed out, I've got low intelligence. I'm minus one in intelligence. That's on checks. So when we get to the places where, like, we're in we're in the fallen technology, I'll get into what the world's about later. But like, when we get into the fallen technology places, and I'm trying to understand this like high tech machinery and information, I'm I'm going to be weak there. But I'm hoping I can get my intelligence up before there. But for now, I'm high agility because I just want to dodge attacks and I just want to survive. I am at the moment quite survivable. Uh, here's my skills. What my con oh, so I'm concentrating on high agility type uh, skills. So I've got swift. You, you can look through these when you play the game. But I've got swift reflexes, spy. I can tumble and flurry. I can do offhand strikes and ambidexterity, which means my offhand weapon will hit more often. Uh, so on and so on. So it's all it's all short bladey agility based stuff. Um, let's have a look at my equipment because this is this is some interesting stuff. Oh, some of my things are covered in slime. Let's go. Let's go and wash them off. Have we got any water anywhere? Oh, the reason everything's green, by the way, is uh, because uh, of my night vision. If I turn my night vision off for you. There you go. So that's just. But well, this is what it would look like otherwise. I can't see shit. My character can't see anything. Uh, you can see around my campfire. The bits, the bits of that that I can see are lit, so I can see them. But otherwise, I can't see anything. So that's why everything's green. Uh, I just want to look for some water. Uh, brackish slime, that's not what we want. Won't bother washing. So if I could find some water, I could wash my gear off just so it looks a bit better. Right, so I've just picked up these HE missiles, which presumably go in some kind of missile launcher, which I don't have yet. Not really interested in that. Probably going to sell them. I've got a bunch of ammo. Uh, I've got Vesto. So at certain points in the game, I think if you kill like a tough enemy or something, sometimes the game will say, do you want to rename one of your items because of this heroic deed? I renamed my uh, vest to Vesto, but I'm not wearing it anymore. Uh, so this is this is this is my in inventory. So I've got a bunch of books. The books are all sort of proc gen. They're kind of interesting. Uh, I've got these implants that I've picked up, but I don't. I've gone to the terminals where you can do cybernetics, but I don't have enough credits to install these implants. So, but I'm going to keep hold of those possibly. Uh, so I've got these batteries. Uh, so when you get, um, I don't think I've got any at the moment, but you'll get like uh, artifacts. Yeah, like uh, strange artifacts and stuff like that you can you can examine those and find out what they are and like a lot of them a lot of mine turned out to be batteries which will be useful during my game i've got a bunch of food got some grenades which I don't really use but you know save them for an emergency got bandages which are used to stop bleeding got weapons i've got this data disc which is part of a quest uh, i've got these injectors which are like drugs so self injector just heals Shade oil makes you better at dodging. Ubernostrum will grow a limb. So you can have a limb chopped off in this game. Ubernostrum will heal you and grow back a limb. Very handy. Uh, a bunch of other weird things. I've got I had far too much water on me. So water is money in this game. This is a post-apocalyptic kind of game. Uh, water is money. Water is scarce. Uh, but I kind of had too much of it. I had so much water that I couldn't carry anything else. So I've kind of divested myself of some of my water. 
uh, and I'm, I'm investing in gemstones because they're lighter. They're a lighter way to carry my wealth around, essentially. Anyway, let's get to my, my actual equipment. So you can see that I talked about the dodge value previously. That's uh, DV is dodge value minus 22. And then AV is armor value, which if you do get hit, obviously negates some. I think they have to get, they have to get through your armor to do you damage. I don't think it negates part of your damage. Um, but I've got very low AV. And you can see from the gear that I'm choosing to wear, uh, that's AV, that's DV, and I've, I've gone for high DV stuff. Relative, like Pretty much everything I'm wearing up to about here gives me some DV and increases my DV, so I've got more chance to dodge. So I've got this slime, slime stained, yeah, I, I could, as I say, I could wash it, but this elastine skin suit, which gives me three dodge value. I've got you know all this stuff, which gives me dodge value. Actually, if I look at that, for example, uh, so this gives me an extra plus two DB while occupying occupying the same tile as foliage. So if I stand in plants, I get it. This is because of my jungle heritage from my arcology, right? Or well, that's where that comes from, uh, that, that item. Um, yeah, I get extra dodge value from standing in plants, actually. And also plus 100 rep reputation with trees, which is nice. If I want to talk to a tree, I'll, I'll, again, I'll get to that later. Okay, so that's just, I'm just giving you an overview of my character. Uh, what I'm actually going to do now is go back to uh, Jopper so I can talk about the world. So th that was all preamble. That was a really long preamble. But I'm just kind of trying to give you a taste of like... So this character's... I don't know how old, actually. Uh, yeah, this character's, say... I, I played this character all of yesterday, basically. So let's say six to eight hours old. Uh, and this is this is where you'll be at. You've got tons of gear and you've got, you know... I'm. Um, in terms of the gear that I'm actually wielding, this is good stuff at this point. This is carb. I've got carbide things. I've got a desert rifle. I've got you know the, those are rubbish. I've got this elastine suit. I've got some pretty some pretty cool gear. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about skills. It's about attributes. It's about uh, your cybernetics, and it's about your gear. There's lots of way to determine what kind of character you are. Uh, so let's teleport. Let's teleport back to town. If I can find my, uh, I'm a little bit blind when I'm making a video. I'd, I'd see this immediately if I wasn't making a video. That's my, uh, looking for my teleporter. There we go. It was slime stained, so I was missing it. My slime stained jopper recoiler. So that will take me back. If I activate that, that will uh, teleport me back to jopper. There we go. Zoop. Cool noise. Right. We're in jopper. Right, I'm going to give you, this is the starting town. I'm going to give you an overview of the game now. So this, the reason I went back here so I could do this. I could have a look at the, 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 the overview map. This is, this is the game world. This is the entire world. One of these, one of these tiles is, is, I think, like nine in-game screens. Uh, I'm currently there. I'm in Joppa. Uh, and I think, I think, like, in all, in my, look, my 78 hours of this game, I've explored like maybe this area. I think I've I think I've been I've been to there maybe maybe a little bit further than that, but like at most I've explored this much. Uh, that might be because I'm terrible at it, but you know, it's yeah, it's but it's already an incredibly rich game, and we've got all this mysterious stuff that I've not even I've not even encountered. So that's Joppa, uh, that's Red Rock. So there's this thing over here out in the desert, the Six Day Stilt. The six day still rises from the dunes like a petrified kraken corpse bearing down upon the vacant flats. I don't even I don't know what that is. Uh, anyway, before I talk about this, so this this world is it's a world where a very high tech civilization has fallen, and it's uh, presumably been thousands of years since that fall, and everybody's f completely forgotten what all that shit is about. Uh, and, and we are in this game. We're very much venturing into the, the remains of that ancient ancient uh, civilization and working out their technology. It might have been that the more than one high tech civilization have fallen. It's it's a very strange world. It's a it's a world where uh, the high tech stuff they find is essentially magic. It's got. I, mean, I do this. I compare games I like to Morrowind a lot, but it's to me it's got that Morrowind alienness. It's got that nice combination actually of familiarity. Like we recognize a lot, a lot about this world makes sense. A lot about this world is like our world, but then a lot of it is also mental and makes no sense at all and is very weird and strange. So it's got that, but it's strange in a cohesive way, and that's important. Uh, it's got that, that yeah, that nice mix of a, the alien and the familiar together in a way that makes sense. So, so imagine, imagine a game like Fallout, but instead of being, is it what is it? Is it decades after the 
after the war that you emerge in fallout whatever rather than being decades or hundreds of years it's thousands of years or even tens of thousands of years so so there's all this high-tech stuff and all these bunkers and nobody understands it it's like that very much got the feel of uh the novel canticle for Leibovitz. uh if you've not read that it's a really great book uh and that's yeah that's another thing it's set it's set after a big technological or a big uh cataclysm uh with a technological collapse uh, and a hostility to technology actually it's got it's got the feeling of that book it's got the ancient like we're approaching this stuff this ancient technology we know it is technology but we don't understand any of it and we're trying to work out what it does uh and because this is thousands, tens hundreds possibly of thousands of years later you'll, you'll encounter like sapient apes or sapient plants i think you can even be involved in in the the burgeoning sapience of something like so you can do something which makes plants sapient and then you can talk to them uh, there are hundreds of factions in this game like every every character will belong to at least one faction so if you meet a frog they will they will always belong to the frog faction they may also belong to other factions and every faction has a faction relationship with other factions so if you do something to please one faction if there's a faction that hates that faction you'll be pissing them off uh, so you might do something to help the frogs and that will piss off the apes uh, and if you meet a, a sentient ape um if 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 the ape faction does not like you then that's essentially a boss they will be hostile and you'll have to fight them if you know if you want to uh whereas if if the ape faction liked you then that that what would have been a boss had they not liked you is just a character that you can talk to and and trade with and tell secrets to and share the water ritual with the water ritual is a little in-game thing um, i won't go into that i'm gonna get sidetracked I might, there's so many ways they can go down rabbit holes with this game so yeah, I, I could meet an ape, and depending on my um, uh, my relationship with apes, that person can either be a friend that I can talk to, possibly get quests from. I think I'm not sure about that, or, or they'll just be a what would be a boss in any other game. So it's got this big complex web of relationships, which is re really lovely. Um, and that's what this game nails. Really, is there's lots of games. So roguelikes, uh, the qual the qualities of roguelikes often are that they are broad in terms of you've got a big world to explore, and this certainly has a big world to explore. Uh, they're deep in terms of you know mechanical depth uh, and emergent, emergent systems and the complexity that comes from those emergent systems, and this game certainly has that. But what they usually miss is the richness. And that's where I make the Morrowind comparison. This game has breadth and depth, like a lot of roguelikes do, but it also, everything feels rich. Everything feels like it's emerged from a thousand-year-old history. And, and that's unusual. That's where this game shines. Uh, I'll go a quick example of that, actually, um, out of this. I'm back in Joppa. I'll look at my journal. So as you venture into the world, you can correct, you can collect information. So I've, I've, you know the locations of places, gossip and lore. I don't have any of that. These sultan histories, village histories, don't have any of any of that. So the sultan histories, sultans seem to be. I should probably say everything in this game. I've not met a game this game at all. I've not read the wiki. I've not done any of that stuff. Maybe bits and bobs, but not very much because I want to discover this game through the game, uh, and that's part of the part of the fun for me. So there's this. So as you, as you go into caves, you'll sometimes find statues of sultans and they'll give you little snippets, little texts about their life. You can, you can find this stuff in books as well and other and via gossip with creatures and so on. But anyway, you find this information in the game. And there's this one, there's this one sultan. I think sultans are like, I don't know whether they're my mythologized people uh, or, or, or gods or just very powerful people or, but the, but they're definitely sort of heavily mythologized and i found this this zer zer the second i really loved all the stuff that i found about him so i'm gonna i'm not very good at reading but i'm gonna read these i just i've i've, I've fallen in love with the sultan and i want to find all of the rest of his histories because because i want to know everything about this person so at the battle of Nokzur, zer the second fought as a mercenary to liberate newly sentient beings he wielded a foreign axe with such prowess that it became forever known as a for foreignocus sentient friend. That's cool. Uh, at midnight, under a curious and vermilion sky, the people of Shack Hollow saw an image on the horizon that looked like a sextant bathed in vermilion. It was Zuzashid II, 
And after he came and left Shaka Hollow, the people built a monument to him and thenceforth called him the Vermilion Sextant. Just just stuff that happens, right? You know, you see something that looks like a Vermilion Sextant, turns out to be a sultan, and therefore he's known as, the, you know, whatever. Yeah, great. While wandering around uh, Seminary City State, Zuzjid the Second stumbled upon a clan of birds performing a secret ritual. Because of this, because of, uh, because of his, his traveling visage, they accepted him into their fold and taught him their secrets. Yeah, great. That's so fucking cool. I love it. I love all of it. Uh, and then he died, which is sad. But yeah, these, this is all prop gen. This is all just like random cobbled together stuff. But it's, that just sounds like such such an interesting character, and I love him, and I want to know more about him. So that's this, that's part of the depth that I'm talking about. But it's also like all of these things that I find. Uh, so you might find like a weird implant that is, and then it, that implant could be referenced in a book, and you get a little snippet about what that's about and why it's there. And obviously, there's a there's a broader thing of like what the fuck happened to this civilization that built all these amazing things. So yeah, that's how I had a look at that one place. So we've got this um, over here. I think that's about the furthest I've got is Grit Gate, which is kind of second second tier starter area. So I've not got all that far. Uh, ruins, ruins, ruins. Got more ruins over here, uh, and then we've got uh, this this village here. So Yak Yakukia, a jungle village of ape god worshippers and their giant mushroom dwellings. Oh, that's fucking cool. I want to go see that. That sounds amazing. And then we've got the like the weird the weirder stuff. Uh, Bethesda Susa, eon shifted stone entombs the ageless architecture of Bethesda's lair. Beth Bethesda's lair, rather. Yeah, don't know, don't know, but it sounds cool, and I want to go there. The Garden of Geth, like awesome. And then this thing, of course, spindle, a hollow ground upon which the spindle, a lengthless needle of Maya blue, meets the earth from where it pierces the firmament. So, I mean, I assume that's some kind of space needle, right? And that's probably important, and I'm probably going there if I survive long enough. And this is the Deathlands, where everything is terrible. So it's a big, it's a big mysterious world that you can find out about. It's not just a mystery box. It's like all of this stuff. If I venture into it, it's, it will be explained like why it's there, what it's doing there, and there'll be like cultures that make sense emerging from that place and from that history. And that's what it's got. Well, that's that's what it's got in common with Morrowind, and that's what's separate from me. That's what separates it from from the other roguelikes. They're all like NetHack is is broad and deep in terms of systems, but it's not got that richness. It kind of leans on the Tolkien stuff for that richness, but it doesn't really. It does, there's not a story to that land. Uh, Tales of Magiel and uh, Ancient Domains of Mystery kind of they lean more that way. They have the same idea. So uh, every time you play Cave of Hood, this overview world, this map will be the same. This will be identical. This, this map will be identical in your game as it is in my game. But when we actually explore. When we go to these places, they'll look different. Like Joppa will be the same. Like cities or settlements are often the same. But like as I venture out into the wilderness and into the caves, that's all procedurally generated. Uh, a lot of the lore is procedurally generated, but also a lot of it is static. And uh, what was my point? I was I was comparing to something. Oh yeah, so NetHack is NetHack in comparison feels very flat. Like the the the. You don't you don't feel like you're exploring a world and discovering its mysteries and discovering how it all fits together and why it became this way, uh, and yeah, that essentially this is this is what sets this aside is that richness, the connection between um, the systems, uh, the places, and the lore, the story, the narrative. Because usually in this game, the narrative is what you do, and that's true in this as well. That the main thing you're thinking about in your head. As Hex said, it's like it's like reading a book is um what you're doing, what what you're up to, the story of your character and his adventures or her adventures. Uh but you've also got that extra layer of I want to find I really want to find out about this world. There's things I've discovered in this world that I want to know about. So as you get as you get deeper into the game, uh, I'm not very deep in yet. I'm, I've kind of been like grinding a little bit in near the starting area to get to get my level up before I venture out. But when you venture out into, you know, e even just this kind of area which isn't hugely deep into the game, you start discovering like underground facilities full of robots and, and factories that are kind of half working and AIs that have gone crazy. And, 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 and if you if, again, like Hex pointed out, my character isn't very intelligent, but if your character is intelligent enough, 
know, you can hack into those systems, you can f- figure out what happened, you can maybe turn them to your advantage, you can use them to do things. It's incredibly rich, and I imagine, like, that's just here. Like, if I go to that place, what's that place? It's just, just a little bit further. Like, it's going to get even more. I'm going to get even even more technological, uh, magical, or weird stuff. So that's Golgotha. Shrouded in the rotting jungles are the mouths of the rust caves of Golgotha, Chrome's graveyard. Yeah, what's that mean? I want to know. I want to find out. And then as we venture, you know, yeah, even further, even closer to this, what presumably is some kind of like a uh, space elevator. Like, what's, what's, what am I going to find there? What magical, technological stuff am I going to find there? It's a wonderful world. Uh, and I, I, I feel like I've done a really poor job of explaining why, but I think that's just maybe, maybe half of the course with these games. They're hard to explain. They're hard to explain why they feel magical. But if you like big, mysterious, alien feeling, but also familiar worlds with lots of narrative to explore, and you like roguelikes, and you like emergent systems, it's a fucking great game. I do, I do think this is... Hex makes a very strong argument for Cogmind, and I agree with him. I agree with everything he says about Cogmind. It's like a, Cogmind is a perfectly crafted thing, and it's like it's robots, and you attach bits to your body, which is pretty cool. Um, so I think... It, 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 uh, of the sort of the family tree of roguelike games coming out of Rogue and, and NetHack, if you go in one, if you go down one branch, you get you get the perfect thing that is Cogmind. If you go down another branch, which is a more narrative branch, a more lore, more rich world branch, you get uh, Caves of Khud. And I think there's a, there's an argument for both of the both of these two essentially are pinnacles on the roguelike landscape. You should try them both. But if you yeah, if you like weird alien mysterious worlds and narrative and finding things out and discovering cultures and, and how things fit together. Caves of Cord is hard to beat. I'm, I've been playing it for like, since Hex's video, uh, which made me go back to it, I've been playing it for three days solid and I'm just lost in this world now. I absolutely adore it. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like I've done a really bad job, so I apologize to you, the audience, uh, for doing such a shit job of explaining this game. But hopefully you got a little something from it and hopefully you're a little bit curious to try it out because it is great. I'm gonna stop saying that now. I'm gonna I'm gonna end. I realize I barely moved my character during this. This this wasn't a playthrough. But let's let's just let's just go. Let's go south. For, there'll be nothing there because these bits around the towns are just empty. Let's go. Let's go. I think I've cleared all these places out, so I'm not gonna be able to give you any action. Yoop. There we go. Is he doing? Oh, it's building zone. Okay, good. Oh, I've not been here. You discover the layer of e- Eeliwood legendary glow pad. So glow pads are like little sentient, uh, what you call them, lily pads that glow. So the layer of, and I'm on good terms with uh, the lily pads. So if I find this legendary, uh, so when it says when it says a legendary, what this is, this is going to be a glow pad that is capable of speech. This is a sentient glow pad. So if I can find his layer, I might be able to talk to this lily pad and be its friend. And that would be amazing. Let me just check that I am friendly with uh, glow pads. You're a glow pad. Uh, neutral. So, yeah, they don't hate me. Have a look at the... I wonder what, what, what faction do glow pads belong to? Uh, plants, I guess. Maybe. P-H-I-J-K. There's no, there's no plants. Oh, glow, glow, no, glow whites. I don't know what function, what faction... Plants belong to. Are they fun? They're not fungus, are they? The flowers, maybe. Okay, flowers are zero, so that's that's okay. So flowers don't care about you, but aggressive ones will attack you. Fair enough. You aren't welcome in the holy places. I wonder if that layer counts as a holy place. Flowers are interested in trading secrets about their locations in the flower fields. There was oh, flowers. I think are in the flowers. A place in the game. I don't know what glow pads, I don't know what faction they belong to. Does this thing tell me? Anyway, no, sorry, I got distracted. I want to go and find this sentient glow pad and talk to it. Uh, I'll go and do that now. Hope you enjoyed this video. I feel it was a bit rubbish, but uh, please rate, like, and subscribe and, and pompchion.com hex DSL. I love you. Uh, bye.